Welcome to the MSME Radio Network, a division of the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network. The following program broadcast is an original creation by the broadcast entity. Discussion within the following broadcast should be used for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice or consultation. Before considering application of any broadcast content in the following program, please consult your health care provider. If you feel you are having a medical emergency, please contact your local health services for immediate assistance. MSME Media and the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network do not guarantee or warrant the accuracy of information in the broadcast to follow. The Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network provisions broadcast services to program host. Information discussed in the broadcast does not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or goals of the network and are solely those of the show broadcast host. Should you wish to host a broadcast, please visit our website at msmemedia.com and submit a request to become a program host. We thank you for listening to the MSME Radio Network. Enjoy the show. I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. This week's episode is special. If you're living with progressive MS in your life, I think this week's podcast is for you. And if you know someone who's living with progressive MS, you may want to shoot them an email with a link to our website, that's realtalkms.com, so that they can listen to this episode as well. And I really think they'll appreciate getting that heads up from you, because this week, our guest on the podcast is Tim Cutsey. Tim is the Chief Advocacy, Services, and Research Officer at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and we're going to be talking about some of the amazing progressive MS research that's going on all over the world. And we'll also be talking about the very first drug that's been approved by the FDA for treating progressive MS. So I think we're going to be getting into a really great discussion in just a couple of minutes. But before we get to Tim... We also learned a couple of other things this past week. Researchers at Duke University are trying to determine whether an iPhone app can really capture the individual experiences of people with multiple sclerosis. You know, one of the things that makes MS a tricky disease is that each patient's experiences can be different. Some people may experience numbness. Others can face difficulty walking. Some people may be dealing with vision impairment or tremor or fatigue. And then to complicate things further, each patient's experiences with MS can be affected by the medication they're taking, their emotional health, even environmental factors. So all of this individualized complexity makes MS research a really complicated undertaking. So this research study is going to try to take all of this individualized complexity and capture it through an iPhone app. So participants are going to be receiving daily, weekly, and monthly questionnaires about their symptoms. Now, those daily surveys are only going to take about a minute to complete, and the weekly surveys are only going to be about 10 minutes. In some of the surveys, participants are going to be asked to perform specific tasks while holding their iPhones, like walking 25 steps, turning around, and walking back 25 steps. There'll be other five-minute tests, including uh, tapping repeatedly on the phone screen to test motor speed, coordination, and fatigue, or playing a pattern-matching game to test short-term memory. And all of the patients on the study can choose to answer some of the questions on the surveys or not to participate in some of those tasks. All of the data that they're going to be collecting on their iPhone is going to be sent to a secure data server, but the participants in the study are going to be allowed to export their own data to share with their doctor. So the study is currently recruiting participants, and if you're interested They're looking for MS patients 18 years old or older who live in the United States 
and are able to read and understand English. Participants must own or have daily access to an iPhone that's running iOS 9 or higher. And if you have an interest in being a participant and you fulfill those basic criteria, you can download the free MS Mosaic app from the Apple Store and then register through the app to get started. And if you have any questions about the study, you can send an email to the research team at ms-app, that's ms-app at duke.edu. Last week, the FDA approved a generic version of Copaxone. Now, generic Copaxone isn't new, but a generic version of the higher dose variety is. As a lot of you already know, MS patients taking Copaxone have a choice of a lower dose daily injection or a higher dose of the drug that requires only three injections a week. So now there are approved generic versions of both the low-dose and high-dose Copaxone on the market. And this is a pretty big deal in the pharmaceutical industry because of the 14 approved drug therapies for relapsing multiple sclerosis, Copaxone is the most prescribed treatment in the U.S. with annual sales of the low-dose form of the drug of approximately $700 million a year and for the higher dose of the drug of approximately $3.64 billion a year for the 12 months ending July 31st. And this new FDA approval of the generic version of Copaxone in both the lower and higher dosages will hopefully help to drive down the cost of that medication. As I said at the beginning of our podcast, we have a very special guest with us today. And I especially wanted this guest to join us on the podcast because today there's some really important research and effort being focused on progressive MS. And that hasn't always been the case. So in a moment, to take us through what's happening right now on the progressive MS research front, Tim Cutsey of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society will be joining us. My guest today is Tim Cutsey, the Chief Advocacy Services and Research Officer at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. And given that incredibly broad title, there are just a bunch of different things that we can talk about with Tim. And today I'm going to focus on a couple of specific subjects that deal with progressive MS. And full disclosure, uh, Tim and I know each other through our work on the Scientific Steering Committee for the International Progressive MS Alliance, which I hope to talk about in a minute. But first off, welcome to the podcast, Tim. Well, John, it's great to be with you. It's just uh, it's great to connect this way and to join you and your listeners. Well, thanks very much. And as, as your title suggests, you wear a lot of hats, and I know your time's valuable. So I really appreciate you spending a few minutes with us today. And I thought we could kind of zero in on the subject of progressive MS, and, and maybe a good place to start is with the International Progressive MS Alliance, which is something that I'm sure some people listening to the podcast aren't fully acquainted with yet. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the alliance is and how it works and what it does. Sure. So um, the Progressive MS Alliance is really one of the most exciting um, things I've been involved with uh, as a staff member at the National MS Society. Um, what it is is it's, a, it's an international effort um, which brings together um, 17 MS societies who are located in 15 different countries along with seven different drug companies that are involved in developing treatments for MS as well as a uh, a, a, an important group of foundations that are also supporting us, and and what this what this collective effort really is about is bringing focus and attention to um, progressive MS and to really being being zeroed in on um, developing new treatments for people with um, the progressive forms of the disease. Um, it, it it really started out of um, basically a cry 
from our community that said, you know, it's it's great that we have all these treatments for relapsing remitting MS. It's a it's a sign that there's so much progress and research. You know, it's it's awesome for those who you know who have relapsing MS to have options. But you know, people with progressive MS feel left out every time a new drug gets approved for relapsing forms of MS. And and this this is really what what um, spurred us because you know to me it was just a, you know we heard this you know cry for help that you know you know come on you know in, in a sense you know people saying to the MS societies of the world you know get together and let's let's find solutions for this and um, we banded our efforts together and we'll talk a little bit more in the podcast I'm sure around what went into making it but you know at the bottom line it's it's about the global community coming together to say you know we don't get solutions to progressive MS as individual organizations we get we find solutions by working together and pooling our resources and finding the way to 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 make progress faster so the alliance is obviously a really clear example but it i think it's really important to point out that the that the progressive MS research effort is really a global effort. Um, how does that fact impact the nature of the research being done? Maybe the mm-hmm. velocity in which some of that research can get done. Um, I, I think it's great. And I, and I know that the progressive MS community, the people who are impacted by progressive MS are, are, are ecstatic over the work that's being done, but the fact that it's a global mm-hmm. effort, I think, is remarkable. Mm-hmm. How does that impact the research? Well, you know, it impacts it in a couple of ways. One is that um, by having a global focus, it allows us to basically say we're going to go with the be- where the best ideas are. We're going to get, you know, find the the leaders wherever the, they are, and we're not going to let geography um, be the boundary. By by which determines who we work with, and so it's it's allowed us to be much more sort of flexible and focused on finding solutions, and and you know that's been a that's been a, a really a a core belief of the National MS Society since our founding uh, in 1945 by Sylvia Lowry, who basically had the 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 attitude that we don't care where you know where the solution to MS is found, we care that a solution to MS is found. And we're going to go wherever that means. And so that's, that's been part of our ethic from the beginning. And that wasn't always shared across other MS societies around the world. Um, and the way researchers worked in other worlds, I mean, there was, there, there was, and still to, the, to this day continues to be a certain amount of, you know, geogra- geographic kind of, um, mindset. But, you know, what the alliance has basically allowed us to do is to say, you know what, we just don't have time for, to let geography separate us. We need to find ways to work together. And the other real, the other functional reality is, is researchers are working across the world collaboratively anyway before the, um, the alliance was, was developed. You know, it, it used to be that people were pretty much individualists working within their individual labs, individual universities, individual companies. But the reality is now is that the challenges of what we're taking on scientifically are so large and momentous and requires so much, you know, so many brains and thinking power that there's just, you know, solo, you know, you just can't do this as solo actors anymore. Uh, it does require a team and people working across, um, across geographies, across disciplines is the way science happens today. And, you know, what the Alliance is basically doing is, uh, is you know, we recognize that and say, and now what we want to do is we want to facilitate that. Let's make that even faster. Let's put resources into it. And, and so it's a, it's a, in many respects, it's a natural outgrowth of the evolution of where the scientific community was and also really the MS, commu- the MS organization community coming together and saying, you know what, guys, you know, collectively, we're, we're stronger than we are individually, and let's just figure out how we make this work. It wasn't easy, but <laughs> we figured out how to make it work. So uh, speaking about how to make it work and how it works, I know this past year, the Alliance got to make some exciting announcements just about a year ago, actually, uh, mm-hmm. about some yep. specific research studies. Can, can you talk a little bit about those? Sure. And I think you were with us at that announcement in London uh, last September. Um, That's right. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the idea behind the Alliance is that, you know, we, we, are, we are an organization that's about, you know, bringing attention to progressive MS, we're an organization that's focused on, you know, telling the story and creating the strategies to say this is what we need as a community. 
Um, the other thing about the alliance is that we also are about funding research and, and funding research in a way that doesn't duplicate the effort that other MS societies are already doing because we have, you know, our own sets of um, research programs. Um, and so we, in the early part of the alliance, we um, said, you know, we're interested in creating momentum. So we basically gave out um, some what we call challenge awards. Um, they were small grants focused on helping scientists, you know, test a new innovative idea and, and, and to really, you know, try to get some of the evidence needed to say, let's pursue this strategy or that strategy. There were small, modest uh, awards for, you know, one to two year duration. Um, and the goal there was really to create momentum. Then we said, okay, we've got momentum. Now what we want to do is we want to facilitate collaboration. And so we created um, a new program, which we call our Collaborative Network Award Program. And uh, basically the idea behind this is that um, we we want to facilitate, we want to invest in research teams with a real emphasis on the team aspect. Uh, that, that are focused on either developing new drugs that treat progressive MS, so discovering and developing those, or uh, developing the tools um, for doing clinical trials faster. And, and that latter point, you know, is really critical. You know, I think most people recognize the importance of pursuing and discovering new drugs, but one of the challenges we have in progressive MS is that it just takes too long to do clinical trials uh, with the tools we have. And so the the idea there was we want to facilitate collaboration among scientists to come up with ways to do trials quicker and faster. So we put out this call for ideas, and you know the the way the way to stimulate science is to say you know we make money available, and so you you basically said we're prepared to provide um, grants um, that for for collaborations to the tune of about a million euro, which is about one point three million dollars a year at the current exchange rate. Um uh it, you know that that would fund a team to give them a one one point three million dollars a year for four years and um to to work in this highly collaborative manner. Um you know the requirements were they had to work in one of the fo- one or more of the focus areas. They had to have at least three researchers who were involved in the team and those researchers needed to be in at least three different countries. So that, that ensured that we had people working across the globe. Uh, we were pretty specific about that. And, uh, you know, we put out this call for proposals. We got incredible response rate. Teams, you know, overall, you know, if, if we had funded everything that came into us, we would have had team, you know, close to 500 scientists involved with us. And it was a, it was a really, you know, as you saw from the process, a really rich kind of experience. Um, so, Going through a lot of decision, you know, really thinking hard about which programs to fund, um, we ended up funding three projects, um, three networks. Um, one is led by a, a, a young professor at Harvard um, uh, by the name of Francisco Quintana, and uh, Fran's team is focused on discovering new drugs that um, have the potential to protect the brain from damage in the future, so really focused on drug discovery in, in new and innovative ways. Um, there's another group uh, led uh, by uh, Professor Gianvito Martino, who's based in Milan, but his team is, he's got folks in uh, San Francisco, in Paris, and Denmark, and several other other parts of the world. Uh, Gianvito's team is focused on discovering drugs that can promote myelin repair and nervous system repair, as well as uh, protecting the brain from future damage. And then the last team is focused on um, developing tools. Uh, it's led by Dr. Doug Arnold at the Montreal Neurologic Institute. And, and what they're doing is that they are applying essentially the, the artificial intelligence um, software and technology to come up with a way that um, they can look at an MRI image of, um, of, that, of people that have progressive MS that are particip- participating in a clinical trial and use those MRI images to make predictions about whether or not a drug is or is not responding uh, when that person is treated with, uh, with it in a clinical trial. It's a, it's a groundbreaking, uh, really big data, artificial intelligence uh, type of software. You know, it's, it, it, you basically, they're taking the kind of technology that, that, you know, the FBI and lots of other people use for facial recognition to, to recognize people and applying it. 
uh, to, to MRIs uh, from people living with MS, and it's a really innovative and important project. And if it works, it gives us a tool that lets us do trials faster. So it's a very exciting group of projects. You know, we have some of the in, incredible leaders in MS research involved with us, and, you know, they're highly collaborative, really passionate, and also involving people with MS in the process and their oversight committees and their engagement. So um, it's a really, um, I'm really proud of that program. Well, so am I. It's funny, I, you know, this is something that I've been involved in with you uh, over a little more than a year now. And uh, even knowing uh, my involvement, when I listen to you talk about those projects, it just literally made me break out in a smile. So uh, so I, uh, I, I, I know how exciting this really is. Uh, and, and if our uh, listeners want to learn more about the International Progressive MS Alliance or any of the work they're fostering, they can go to the Alliance website at ProgressiveMSAlliance.org and get all the information there. But yeah. a, a, a few minutes ago, you mentioned mm-hmm. how challenging it is to bring a drug to market that can mm-hmm. uh, help the folks with primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS. And uh, this past spring, there was finally some really encouraging news for families dealing with progressive MS when the FDA approved mm-hmm. the first drug therapy for primary progressive MS. It's called Ocrevus, and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about Ocrevus. Certainly, and that was exciting news. I mean, getting uh, hearing that the FDA approved Ocrevus in the spring, and now actually Australia and Switzerland have also approved it, so it's good news for people living in those countries. Um, you know, it's a, it was a big movement to get that first treatment for primary progressive MS. Um, you know, I, I've equated it to when the first treatment for relapsing MS, beta serum, came onto the market, and that was in 1993. And, you know, it was a... A, a huge milestone to get beta serum approved after a long stretch trying to find treatments, and really that that approval opened up, you know, a, a, you know, a floodgate of research and development that's given us all these treatments, and you know, we're hoping Ocrevus does the same thing. So, you know, for your listeners who who might not be as so aware as like, so what is Ocrevus? Um, so Ocrevus is the you know the the brand name for a, a drug uh, called Ocrelizumab. And basically what it is, is it's a, it's a molecule, it's an, an antibody, it's an immune molecule that um, has been um, developed. And, and basically the, the function of Ocrevus is to, um, when, when it gets infused into a person's bloodstream, it's to find a specific type of white blood cell in our bloodstream. And, uh, you know, our, our bloodstream has, our immune system is made up of, of white blood cells that are involved with fighting off diseases and viruses and all sorts of stuff. And, um, you know, as you might imagine, there's all different kinds of white blood cells uh, that have different focuses, different purposes. And um, what Ocrevus does is it, it zeroes in, you know, kind of like a smart bomb on a specific Group of white blood cells known as B cells. Um, these are the these are the cells that make antibodies that help us fight off infections and viruses and all that other stuff. And it, it, it hones in on a specific type of B cell. So you know there's there's different types of B cells. Just like you've got lots of different types of cars out there, <laughs> you've got different types of B cells. And and the way uh, scientists distinguish B cells are it's sort of by what molecules are on the the, the surface of these cells, and um, what the, what Ocrevus does is, is it it goes right for these cells that have another molecule on their cell surface called that's called CD20, and it's does you folks don't have to worry about it. CD20 is basically the name for a, a marker, and it just happens to be number 20 in a grouping <laughs> of them, but it's very specific. And it, it what Ocrevus does is it tags those, and then those are removed. Uh, basically, those those B cells die. And, and the idea behind it is that removing those B cells specifically in people with both either relapsing MS or primary progressive MS uh, prevents those cells from going into the brain and causing the damage that is associated with relapsing MS or primary progressive MS. Um, it, it's a you know really a landmark um, finding. Um, it, it's a, it's a you know it's a treatment that you know came you know was based on 
you know, many decades of work um, by the scientific community who were able to identify that, yes, B cells are involved in MS, and yes, a specific type of B cell seems to be the main actor in MS. And then um, basically, um, initially, people worked with another drug called Rituxan, which some people listening to this podcast may have had as a treatment for um, their MS. Uh, and they did some studies in Rituxan, and then eventually that led them to look at Ocrevus as a as a as an option. Um, it really, uh, for us, you know, it represents you know an important milestone. Uh, but also, I'd say it's it represents, in my mind, the beginning, not the end. That where you know Ocrevus doesn't work for everybody. It's you know seems to um, be most effective um, in people who maybe have primary progressive MS that are younger, that have disease activity on their MRI. But, um, you know, the way I think about it is it's just this is just the beginning and that we need to continue to focus on getting more and better treatments uh, beyond Ocrevus. Well, as somebody whose family was personally impacted by progressive MS, I am thrilled that we're now talking about a tangible beginning instead of hoping for one down the road. And um, I, I know all the great work that hey, you have been so masterful in breaking down so that everybody can kind of follow along what's happening here. I know that's going to produce some uh, uh, amazing results as we move forward. So, Tim, I just want to thank you again for your time. It's been an extraordinary little stroll down the progressive MS research path, and I think uh, people who are concerned about progressive MS are, are going to come away feeling a little bit differently than they may have felt before we had this talk. So, so thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome, and thank you to your listeners for joining us. I think, you know, um, I am optimistic, and I just, you know, uh, look forward to being able to get back on your podcast and not at some point in the future and talk about the next set of developments. I can't wait. Thanks again. Thank you, John. Wow. I hope you came away from that conversation feeling as if you got some good information. I just think that there are so many important things happening in the progressive MS arena, finally, that we can even begin to see some hope on the horizon, and that is an incredibly good feeling. And speaking of incredibly good feelings, let me also say thank you to those of you who have sent me an email with some of your comments and suggestions for future podcast episodes. That's always appreciated. Feel free to visit our website at realtalkms.com and leave some comments of your own. I'd love to hear from you. And I'd also love it if you enjoy what you're hearing on the podcast, if you could take a moment, head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. That's always very, very helpful. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of Real Talk MS. I'm John Strum. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Uh -huh.